Hello, South Dakota EMS, Bill Justice from Oklahoma. It's a pleasure to be here with you this year. I wish we could be face-to-face -face enjoying adult beverages. However, uh, this COVID stuff has just really got everyone twisted. So uh, this presentation is on airway management along with some uh, basic cardiac um, material involved as well. So uh, I hope you enjoy it. I look forward to your questions to follow and uh, hopefully keep you on track. So as we get through this, this next slide, uh, fairly graphic, is um, as this patient presents to you, he was on a balcony, the balcony collapsed, and uh, he was skewered by a uh, pole, a traffic uh, sign pole that was below the balcony. Uh, this patient's up and walking when EMS arrived on scene. So the takeaway here is basic airway management for someone like this is to keep them in a seated position uh, where we can keep their airway open. And he actually was managing his own airway uh, very well. So there wasn't any other intervention truly it needed to be other than us just positioning him in the right way. So there are times then we have to adapt to um, be more effective. And that may mean adapt in positioning the patient or adapt in what utilization of what equipment we're using for that patient to get the job done. So BSDS stands for Better Start Doing Something. And uh, this presentation was put together years ago uh, by myself and my best friend, Scott Bolliter. Um, so again, we have taken this and we've adjusted it throughout the years as new airway equipment is added or new procedures are added but I certainly wanted to give uh, Scotty uh, kudos for his intervention with this as well. So first, some steps and kind of a GPS roadmap, if you will, uh, for us as we approach our patients. So first of all, checking the scene, making sure that the scene is safe and that we're being safe as well. Matter of fact, one of the new additions now that a lot of you are getting in your dispatch information is, is the, the uh, patient has, or somebody at the residence, has tested positive for COVID. So again, just another little checkbox for us to uh, consider. Next, we look at the patient's level of consciousness. So we know that any alterations can certainly be significant. We look for that. You are 911. So as you arrive on the scene again, though, we wanna make sure that, hey, do we need other resources? Is this a big event that's uh, escalating and getting bigger or is it something we can handle just with the resources that were dispatched? And then we look at the ABCs. Now, going retro with you, ABCs were the, the primary um, guidelines that we used. And then if you remember with the uh, International uh, Committee on Resuscitation, they changed it to CAB, Circulation, Airway, and Breathing. So whichever uh, acronyms you're using, Again, we do need to have a structured response to the patient uh, so we don't overlook anything. So once again, we look at altered mentation, respiratory compromise of any kind, and then any type of, pardon me, any kind of uh, hemodynamic instability uh, that they may have at that point. Moving on to the next slide. So with this patient, usually uh, in the trauma bay, um, as some last ditch efforts of uh, uh, open heart compression or open um, compression with this patient, usually as last ditch efforts. So as we are looking at this slide, mechanism of injury and re respiratory compromise can be caused from many different things. So the old up and over pathway for folks that are unrestrained in their vehicles, uh, and as that steering wheel hits the chest, certainly be significant. So it's nice to know if there is a mechanism involved with this, what that was, and what we uh, can think uh, the kinetic energy would be or that energy transfer that's going through the body. The down and under that you see in the top right image there, uh, again, patient still hitting the steering wheel, breaking it, but going the underneath the dash where we have lower extremities involved too. Still, though, the primary problem is that we have that respiratory compromise due to the steering wheel. Next, crush syndrome. So uh, you see the bottom left image is the patient's being crushed between the loading dock and the, lo and the van. Uh, issue there is 
uh, abdominal trauma, but also can also uh, cause some respiratory uh, distress with that. And then falls, as you see on the bottom right, uh, on this particular uh, person as well. Some things to consider are what we term distractors. And those distractors are things that kind of get our attention. Uh, they can, can be an injury that looks really ugly, but perhaps not that significant. And it's taking our focus away from the things truly killing the patient. So we've talked earlier about bleeding control being the number one factor on the trauma side of the house and the number one killer. Um, sometimes we, we can overlook that because we're looking at something else that's a distractor. So uh, I'll share this image with you. You can see that this patient had multiple fractures in their lower extremities. And uh, a lot of times folks would get uh, very focused on this and that they would overlook the fact that this person is bleeding somewhere else or that they are in respiratory distress or respiratory arrest. And they just simply overlook that. So again, we have to overlook uh, things like that. And you see that avulsion there on that patient's shoulder, uh, which has also caused clinicians clinicians in the past to get high centered on that and focused and overlooking other significant injuries or an illness pattern that is going on. So let's look back to uh, early years. This would have been acceptable for C-spine immobilization back then. And I think we would all question that in current day. So we have gotten better. And as we look at the devices and the products that are on the market today to make our job a little bit easier, we do do that well. Interestingly enough, where all the patients um, in the 70s, 80s, and early 90s were all getting backboarded, and we're not seeing that now. We're seeing select patients being backboarded, but not everyone, which I certainly agree with. This person happened to be, uh, it's an off-duty firefighter who was hunting, and uh, he fell out of his deer stand, and in my opinion, he must have hit every branch on the way down to the ground. So you see a lot of soft tissue injury there with him. You see the C collar has been properly sized, placed on him, but here's the issue. If we put him now on a backboard, laying on his back with that much oral secretions that are there, then that's where you see that image on the right, DWPA, and that's death with paramedic assistance. So we have to make sure that we're properly positioning these folks at the same time we're protecting that airway. And so in different positions with him, uh, certainly should be utilized and not uh, having him in a supine position. So let's, let's talk about the new uh, concepts that are coming out. Um, most of you are aware that uh, mid-month, this month, as a matter of fact, will be five years since... Uh, uh, guideline change from the American Heart Association or American Red Cross, whoever you use. So uh, it's every five years. So uh, we'll go from the 2015 guidelines to the 2020. And uh, interestingly enough, nothing's changing. Nothing. It's staying the same. So they're changing our books, they're changing our DVDs, which we'll have to buy new stuff. But as far as the material and the interventions, nothing will be changing. So what that tells us is that you and I are doing a great job with the current interventions we're doing. We're seeing results that are have been the best for our patients. So as we look at CPR, we'll still stay with the ratios 30 and two, five sets. As far as rate per minute, 100 to 120, we know that 130 compressions per minute is too fast. And I gotta tell you this, there is no way you can tell the difference at 120 or 130 compressions in the heat of the moment when you're pumped up, you simply can't do that. So the use of that metronome uh, that you have either uh, Velcro to your defibrillator, or if you're using the AED um, metronome that you have there, it is imperative that we have some type of a device to help us with the rate per minute uh, during this because we simply fall off the plateau if we're doing 130 compressions per minute. There's no pre-fill. There's nothing in the heart. There's nothing going to squish out. So at that point, again, the use of the metronome is paramount. Uh, once an advanced level clinician uh, is involved, they put an advanced airway device in place, then our ratios go away. It's continual compressions of that 100 to 120 per minute. Interposed breaths, one breath, 
every six seconds, every six seconds. The importance of that is 10 breaths a minute. Uh, I got to tell you on that, those of you that are older clinicians have been doing this for a while. You remember the days where we thought more was better and hyperventilation was what we needed to do. And we figured out that hyperventilation is deadly. So we cannot allow ourselves to hyperventilate this patient. We have to slow down. And it's unfortunate, a human response to something of, hey, we didn't see this patient crashing. All of a sudden, now they crash. Our sphincters get tight and we do things fast. We have to make sure that whoever's doing the ventilations is we tap them on the shoulder and say, hey, slow down a little bit and let's give that one breath every six seconds. Again, hyperventilation is deadly. Then as we look at the second priority uh, in cardiac arrest is defibrillation. The use of AEDs are there. They're simply uh, extremely valuable for us uh, also too. Um, I question uh, the use of pediatric pads because you can use adult pads on the pediatric patients. Again, personal opinion. Um, but if we stay with the adult pads, you just simply place them, one on the front, one on the back of a pediatric. Uh, you're saving yourself some money, but using adult energy on a pediatric patient will not harm them. So again, it gives you that option. Um, if you use PD pads, then Nothing wrong, obviously, with that either. I'm just simply throwing an option out there for you that seems to be helpful. Now, uh, again, uh, the newer techniques and the one that we do see in my video is not going to play for you, so I apologize for that, but is compression only. And with compression only, we do see this even more so important now that if you're at Walmart and somebody collapses, it is doubtful that you're going to lip lock that person with the current status of COVID. So the thing is, it is important to do compression only, and um, it has shown its value. Now, keep in mind, it's only going to be effective for about six minutes, six minutes. So the thing there is, are you going to start doing mouth to mouth at that six minute mark? The answer is probably not, but uh, it gives us that uh, bridge effect until somebody can get there with advanced uh, or or at least your equipment, your BVM or mouth to mask uh, or a pocket mask arrives, that you can implement that. Also, 2019, the numbers showed that there were more compression only done in the hospital. Now, if we look at that, because compression only was primarily focused on uh, or for civilian uh, intervention, folks in the field, but our patients in the hospital, so those of you that are hospital-based, they're simply sneaky. So they collapse in the break room, they collapse in the lobby, they collapse in the elevator, or they collapse in a non-clinical area. And so you're standing there thinking, well, mother of God, why me? So start compression only, call for the code team, and then we intervene further from there. If we're pre-hospital, the same thing. Start compressions if you're at Walmart, and then as soon as EMS gets there, we can start the ventilation process at that point. All right, uh, the choking, just to remind you that uh, if the patient was awake and choking, it's still abdominal thrust. If they lose consciousness, it is CPR. Uh, that change has been in effect for five plus years, or matter of fact, I think two, 10 years uh, now, so it's still there. Since we're in football season though, I did have to take a jab at my uh, fellow Texans uh, just down the road. So I'll throw this out there to you that uh, it's still in play. And uh, I'm hoping everybody is enjoying some of your sporting teams uh, that are playing currently. All right, talked about compression only already, but uh, again, it has shown and proven its importance to have and the value of doing that. So making sure too though, that we're staying within that 100 and 120 compressions per minute is important. Luckily, they have free apps on everyone's phones that you can download. So pick a cool, sexy uh, uh, note or rate or song or whatever uh, for that 100 and 120 uh, compression beat per minute. And uh, again, those apps are free. All right, talking about CPAP, uh, earlier older medicine, uh, there was a device known as a demand valve, and it was kind of the poor man's CPAP, if you will. The newer devices that you see, 
that's being utilized on the right image there for you makes it much easier and safer uh, for the patient. So the demand valve, uh, if you weren't cautious, it did uh, allow us to do a, again, that poor man's CPAP, but a lot of folks that would keep their finger on that trigger, it, it could literally uh, cause the uh, patient's underwear to blow off uh, or more realistically cause a pneumothorax, which is not what we wanted. The newer devices work extremely well. Looking at uh, cardiac rhythms, uh, VFib, VTAC are still the ones that we can fix the easiest. And although the patient is clinically dead, these are viable rhythms, viable. So start with really good uh, CPR. It's gotta have it, it's gotta be your baseline. Next, we're gonna add that defibrillation with your AED, or if you're an advanced clinician, uh, the manual defibrillators. But we have to have both of those in concert to be effective uh, with these patients, and we can be. Our job is to prevent this rhythm, which by the way, is the most stable rhythm out there. Once the patient seems to get here, we almost cannot get them out of it. It's almost impossible. So um, as we look at this, the thing is we can add CPR. It's a non-shockable rhythm. I think at this point, add prayer. Maybe that'll help us. Um, but our job truly is preventing a systole, not truly treating it at that point. So as we look at kids, um, <clears throat> a lot of folks are nervous when it comes to intervention with children, especially really, really, really small children like the image you see on the right. Uh, with that, there are devices out there to help you. So the Broslow system works extremely well and has been around for a long time. There's a new system out called Antevi, and Antevi makes it very, very easy also to utilize both basic equipment and advanced equipment. So uh, for the advanced clinicians on drug dosages even. But if you haven't done that in a long time or you don't deal with pediatrics, often uh, either the Broslow or the Antebi systems are very, very helpful. So do your research, do your investigation, and you decide which one you want to use from there, and it does work extremely well. All right, as far as C-spine immobilization and airway management on kids. Uh, I mentioned earlier in a different presentation that we don't wanna lay infants down on their back. And you can see why in this top left image, it puts their chin to chest, which is a bad position for any of us. So uh, with that, we need to make sure we're raising uh, the shoulders. So if you have uh, commercial made devices, like you see in the bottom right image there that we can put underneath the infant, uh, it keeps their head in that midline position or that sniffing position and it works well. A towel will do the same thing or even your hand placed underneath their shoulder blades will give us that same process. You can see the child in the bottom left, uh, he is in the same uh, predicament. He needs something underneath his shoulders to bring his, his uh, airway into a more patent uh, and stable position. Using the proper C collars too, as you see in the top right with this, which these have been placed correctly and also keeps that uh, patient's airway in the right one. So uh, those of you that may need a little caffeine break, now's your chance. I'm gonna sip some with you and uh, watch as this video proves to why men die early. Enjoy. That last segment is my favorite. 
And there's the answer of why men die early. It's the women's fault. You get our attention off of what we're doing, and then we get ourselves in trouble. Just throwing it out there. All right, let's move on. So other means of airway control, uh, we can look at several. Uh, another cartoon from Steve Barry, and he's got some great, great material. But let's let's talk about some other options and actually the equipment that uh, makes airway management just a little bit easier for us. There's a long list. I've listed some here for you, and we'll break some down individually for you uh, so we can get a better look. So um, first of all, that bottom right image, we have 10 different sizes of oral airways. We have uh, 10 different sizes of uh, nasal airways. So as we look at oral airways, you measure from what? And as you're pausing or some of you are already talking to your computer, it's from the earlobe to the corner of the mouth, yes? And we want to get close. The device should touch both those areas to get close. If we put one in that's too big, we have an occlusion of the airway um, and then certainly triggering the gag reflex if it's too small. It's not going to be effective, and also you can actually have it drop in the oral airway, which is not uh, what we want. Um, oral airways used only on unconscious patients, yes? So the upside then is we look at nasal airways, they can be used on conscious and unconscious patients as well. From the manufacturers then, nasal airways should be placed in the right nostril, uh, but for common sense, if you look and the uh, left nostril is uh, larger, then put it in the left nostril. Matter of fact, since the patient has two nostrils, you could use two nasal airways if you wish. Just before placing them in though, making sure that they're lubricated. Now, you can use uh, lubricating solutions or if the patient has a runny nose because it's now October and November, in those months where everybody's nose runs, they have a bloody nose, that can be a lubricant too. It does have to be lubricated. So in the month of June and, and July in your state, uh, mine as well, where our nasal passages are dry, just make sure that we're lubricating that uh, very, very well so um, the device will slide in to the proper place. So once again, oral airways used for unconscious patients only, nasal airways, conscious and unconscious patients very effective there. Um, you can see on the screen uh, for the advanced clinicians, the LMAs, which uh, now a competitor called the iGel is being used. Both are very simple to use. Uh, very, very, very uh, good. Now in some states, and I'm not sure about South Dakota, so I hope somebody can educate me if uh, basic EMTs can use the iGel in your state. So I look forward to hearing your answers on that because uh, I like to know what's going around on around the country. Uh, combi tubes uh, were the predecessor for the King Airways. Some folks are still using Kings now today. Uh, I like the device. It does seem to control the lumen more than using the iGel or the LMA, which simply is a top hat over the airway itself. However, um, there are some uh, side effects from overinflation of the bulb that certainly can cause us some problems, primarily with uh, causing hypotension if it's uh, overly inflated. So that is why a lot of folks seem to uh, lean toward the iGel use over the use of the King Airway or the LMA. Bag valve masks, we've talked earlier about hyperventilation. I just wanna remind you one more time, breaths 10 per minute, 10 per minute and not over that. All right, let's move over and look at some other things. We talked about this already, the oral airways versus nasal airways. Uh, some of you older clinicians, uh, like myself, remember that uh, when I started in the early 70s, we had three different sizes of air, uh, oral airways. They were metal, looked just like this. And if you're wondering what those strings were for, that was for us fishing that device out of the patient's uh, back of their airway as it fell down because we weren't uh, using the right sizes, and again, they were metal. Oh, by the way, when you got back to the station, or if you were hospital-based, after you finished with your patient, you would go back, rinse it off, and then put it back either in your go bag, or you put it back on the crash cart, and they were used over and over and over, uh, unlike our products that we use today. A little bit of history for you as we go. 
All right, looking at this device specific called the Rescue Pod. Uh, when I first saw this device, um, they run average about $110 a piece disposable. Um, I thought, this is crazy. Why would we spend that much money on a device like this? And what is it doing for us? Well, I will tell you this, the value of this device is unbelievable. I don't work for the company. I'm not selling your product. I'm just saying that what this does is it decreases the pressure in the chest, which enhances our CPR and ventilatory management. It simply works. Also too, as you look at that left image there, uh, the right of that device, top right, you see that red button. When you flip that, uh, it causes the device to light up every seven seconds, which will tell the ventilator to give a breath. So again, we say five to six, this device was set on seven because when it first came out, uh, it was one breath every six to eight seconds and they went middle of the road. So this still does keep us on track from not hyperventilating the patient. It is only used on a patient in cardiac arrest. If we get ROSC, return of spontaneous circulation, then we will pop this device off and simply ventilate the patient without it. If they re-arrest, then you put it back on your mask, if that's what you're using, which has to be held tightly to the face, or if you're using some type of advanced airway device, or again, the eye gel or the King airway, it does work with those devices as well. So my early uh, impression of this was it wasn't valuable. I was wrong. It is very valuable and it has shown great value. And also it has shown um, a big difference in our survivability rates uh, as we look at that. Some old and new devices for you, uh, the EOA, and this goes way, way back uh, to early airway management. Uh, the problem with this is that it gave a false sense of security. You placed it, and this is the top left image device that I'm uh, describing to you now. But the folks, uh, if they didn't keep the, the mask tight with a seal on the patient, you lost your volume. We didn't ventilate the patient very well at all. Then came, uh, the bottom left device called the PTL, pharyngeal tracheal lumen, um, pretty much the same thing, type of a small or, or false sense of security. Uh, it was difficult to get a seal, but it was the predecessor to the combi tube that you see in the top right. And then as everybody seemed to transition into the King airway, which again, a lot of states still use those today uh, if they haven't moved on to the eye gel. So, a little bit of history where we were, where we come to now. And again, you can kind of pick and choose which device you like best. The LMA, uh, there are multiple styles of that. The difference in the LMA versus the eye gel is the LMAs uh, have a pneumatic uh, cuff that need to be inflated. The eye gel uh, is filled with jelly, does not need that extra step of placing any air or anything else in the device to make it work. So both are very effective, they work great. And again, from there, certainly uh, an advantage for us as far as our airway management goes. Then as we look at uh, intubation, the golden airway maneuver, because we do own, uh, is this. Sometimes our patients are difficult to intubate, whether it's a medical emergency uh, or a traumatic emergency, they're difficult to look at. Since we're in football season, then these are the vocal cords. So compare this then to the end zone uh, or the goalposts in the end zone, if you will, the uprights. And that's what the clinician is looking for with this. They're looking for those vocal cords and that's where they're gonna pass that endotracheal tube through, uh, through that. Uh, and again, due to anatomy or if it's a traumatic event and there's a lot of blood present, uh, sometimes those vocal cords are hard to see and again, causing some trouble. Retrograde intubation is another technique uh, that's still used today. And that would be, you've got this person who the anatomy has been disrupted. Um, we can actually place uh, a needle in the uh, trachea, lower trachea. We put a guide wire through that. The guide wire comes through all this garbage that you see there or muck, if that's a better term. Um, then at that point, you put the endotracheal tube over the guide wire and obviously, it goes back into where uh, we inserted it and easy transition into the trachea itself. Again, uh, option and a tool in the toolbox for the advanced clinicians. So here's something that comes up quite often 
and uh, another cartoon from, from Steve. But the thing is, why transition into an advanced level procedure if the basic level procedure is working? If we're bagging the patient and their pulse oximetry and intotal CO2 is, is doing very well, then why would we want to switch to an advanced level uh, 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 implementation or intervention um, when the other's working? And that's often where we see advanced clinicians get in trouble. Um, for instance, uh, they paralyze a patient who doesn't need to be paralyzed, but now all of a sudden they can't control that airway. That is an issue. And as you see in, in Steve's cartoon, he's making uh, a great point is, you know, sometimes it's just uh, those clinicians showing off or, or wanting to do something because they can. It doesn't mean that we need to. So I come back to the, the point of let's do very, very good basics first before we transition into advanced level care. All right, we're seeing some other helpful toys on the market today. Uh, a lot of them. Uh, you see the glide scope on the right uh, there. Most of your anesthesia teams use similar devices, if not this one in the ER as well. Uh, for the pre hospitals uh, folks, uh, there's a handheld glide scope. There's air trach that you see there, and there are multiple other devices that are out there as well. Um, my suggestion to you is get with your vendors. Your vendors are, they, they sell product, yes, but they're also good educators. So have them come in and educate you guys on uh, what's out there, how to use it, and they can even tell you about their competitors as well. As we look at capnography, Bob Page is one of the gurus in capnography uh, education in itself. We do, we use this for two different reasons. The first reason capnography was used was to make sure if we used an advanced airway device or a basic device, the King Airway and now the iGel, is that it actually went in the right place, right? Uh, primarily though, on the intubation part, we wanted to make sure it's in the trachea, not the esophagus or belly. So that would give us a reading there. The other important reason for using cap capnography today is that it guides our resuscitation in CPR. If the normal capnography reading is 35 to 45, normal reading, 35 to 45. We have now a patient who's arrested, we're doing CPR, we have to be above the magic number of 10. So if we're at 15 and 17 or maybe 19 on your capnography, you're doing great and that's good compressions. But if we see that we started at 15, now we came down to 13 and now we're hovering at 11, whoever's doing compressions currently simply suck. And so we've got to get them off the chest. It's time to switch. They're either tired or if they started out and they're only giving us an 11 or a 10, then they don't know how to do CPR. So the thing is get them off the chest and get somebody on there. They can give us a higher capnography than the number 10. We will not get ROSC back if we are doing CPR and we have 10 or less in a capnograph simply won't do it. So again, let that be your GPS and your roadmap to guide you in the resuscitation. It's priceless. All right, let's talk about patients who uh, have uh, laryngectomies or tracheostomies and they breathe through those. Um, my guess is your state like mine, the wind blows a lot. So it dries these airways out. And a lot of these patients uh, get in trouble when uh, the mucus gets very thick and they can't clear their own airway. So we suction them. So just keep in mind when you're suctioning somebody, we have to give them a break in there, uh, whether we're letting them get their own breath or we're giving them supplemental oxygen to keep that oxygen level up to normal as we're doing the suctioning. But then also too, uh, sometimes we can take a uh, uh, small uh, syringe of saline and uh, slide in there and break up some of that mucus and make it easier to suction that out with, and again, uh, pre-oxygenating and then after oxygenation after we do that process. But these devices are easily occluded, especially again with that thick mucus that does occur. Now, here's an interesting position for you. And uh, in an earlier presentation, I used the same acronym, TAR, stands for that ain't right in our state. Uh, and it works, it'll work in South Dakota as well. 
But the thing is, if we see a patient in this position, this is crucial. The doorway assessment of tripod position is ugly. And it means that they're trying to make their chest bigger. And with that, they're in trouble. They are struggling to get their breath. So this is a huge sign for you and I that the patient is truly in some respiratory distress. So don't forget that the tripod position is ugly. I mentioned this earlier too on uh, uh, chest expansion and symmetry. We've got a patient that their chest looks like this. We also call that uh, TAR. Um, a simple pneumothorax, which is very common in patients that are first tall, skinny, um, smokers have more apt to blow a pneumo than non-smokers, but what really got my attention is, and what's been in the literature for years, long distance runners can just blow a spontaneous pneumo, which I thought was odd. Now, if we have other issues, trauma involved, then attention to a new, simple pneumothorax going to attention pneumothorax is we look for those signs and symptoms. So those are simply on the mental status part. Early on, they're restless, they're anxious, they're scared. Next, it goes to, oh, they're starting to respond slower now. They're confused, lethargic, and then they go to unconsciousness. That's that slope on the uh, mental side. On the respiratory side, they're trouble getting their breath, they're struggling. You see that tripod position uh, most commonly. Next, you'll see a asymmetrical uh, movement of the chest. So the side that's affected is not moving as much as the unaffected side. And then lastly, radial pulses or distal pulses are very weak or they go away. Those are the uh, what we term the trifecta at that point where the patient needs intervention from somebody on the advanced level. They're going to take a large needle, 10 gauge, three and a quarter inches long, and insert into the chest, second or third intercostal space, midclavicular, or fourth or fifth intercostal space, lent, uh, lateral anterior side, which is uh, closer to your armpit. Uh, either one of those locations works extremely well. Also too, making sure the placement is done on the top of the rib, not the bottom, where the vasculature is under every rib you've got, artery, vein, nerve, under every rib. All right, so as that is done, the needle has been placed or the chest tube is in place, the air is evacuated from the uh, thoracic cavity, the lung returns to um, fairly normal function, and the heart is not being squeezed either by the pressure and can work uh, better. So let's look at a case study then. 23-year-old male is sitting propped up against the wall after being assaulted with a baseball bat. He has ecchymosis or bruising on the right side of his chest. He initially complained of severe difficulty in breathing, increased pain on inhalation, he is now cyanotic with decreasing level of con consciousness and JVD is present. So we have mechanism of injury. We have this person who is already in that position that we talked about before where it's significant to you and I, and we're, we're looking that, hey, this person's having trouble breathing. As now we're closer and we're making our, our hands-on assessment, we can tell that the uh, movement of the chest is asymmetric as we listen to the lung sounds on the third part there are absent on the right and decreased on the left. The trachea appears to be deviated, which I disagree with. You're normally not gonna see this, but they put it in this particular case study. So I left it, it's not my case. But with that, uh, again, very, very, very late sign that you're gonna see with that. Usually the medical examiner is making that assessment, not you and I. Vital signs, blood pressure 88 over 70. Uh, the pulse 128 and weak, the radial pulses may not be there, may not be there. Now keep in mind, I said radial pulses, the brachial pulses may be weak, the carotids are still there, but they're weakening too because the heart's being squished that much and it'll come to a point where the heart will stop. Respiratory rate 36th and shallow and again that asymmetrical movement. So you know what's wrong with the patient now, you know what they need. So if you're a basic clinician, simply be on the phone or radio saying, hey, I need an ALS intercept and give them those signs and symptoms and say, I really think this patient has a tension pneumothorax. That's an exceptional assessment by you. And it certainly has the advanced clinicians thinking about their game plan 
when they arrive on scene. Uh, if you're an advanced clinician, then you already have all the information that you need and you should have already been decompressing this chest anyway. So there you go. And again, it's an easy process and it's an easy fix. All right, needle decompression. Again, this is the anterior approach, second or third intercostal space, top side of the rib. And it talks about on the second um, notation there about an audible rush of air. That's an exception to the rule, not the rule. So sometimes you get that rush of air and you can hear it. You may be in a noisy place where you can't hear it anyway, or simply outside and the wind is blowing and you don't hear it. So what we're looking for are results from the patient. Hey, the respiratory distress got better. Um, those pulses, radio pulses got stronger and their uh, mentation has gotten better and improved. So those are the signs and symptoms we're looking for from this. And um, again, <clears throat> very effective. On an earlier presentation, we talked about this too, uh, improvised chest seals. Uh, we don't worry about the open window any longer. So there's no more three-sided taping. It's all four-sided. Uh, other uses, a gloved hand makes a very good chest seal. Your defibrillator pads make a good chest seal if you're using something improvised. If you're using commercial made devices, they are full circumference now. They, they um, uh, will cover all um, uh, four sides, if I can articulate now at the end of the day. All right, surgical crikes. Uh, the manufacturers have made it easier for that to be accomplished. So those of you that are advanced clinicians and you're doing this, uh, I want you to consider the bougie assisted crike um, that's out on the market today. It works great. There are many manufacturers that have this available to you. Uh, the bougies do make intubation very, very easy and it's working. As far as the scalpel goes, as you see these pictures, we do linear cuts now not those lateral ones any longer from like uh, earlobe to earlobe, unless you work for the mafia, we're not doing that. So with that, <clears throat> uh, the linear uh, approach, and it's very, very, very small holes. And there are other devices out there too. This is the new trach um, that's been around for a long time. Uh, Cook Medical makes some devices as well. So a lot of them, if you're the advanced clinician, do your research and see what you like best. I do though like the bougie assisted products. So that brings us to the end of this presentation. I hope you've enjoyed it. I certainly appreciate your time. Stay safe out there and we'll talk soon.